Today we're going to be comparing six different bean to cup machines, machines that kind of make a promise. They say, just give us beans, just give us water. We'll take care of the rest. We'll make you delicious coffee. We're going to find out if that's true. Now I have six different models here to compare as chosen by my Patreon supporters, and they're pretty big. So we're going to have to go a little bit wider to show you everything that's on the bench today. Now they're going to run up in price. So starting at this end is the Melita Barista TS. That's a thousand pounds. The cheapest thing we're going to look at today. These get expensive. I'll warn you now. Next up is the DeLonghi Dynamica Plus. That I think was about 1200 pounds. Next to that is the Gagier Academia. This was 1250 pounds. Next is the Siemens EQ9, 1700 pounds. A bit of a jump up in price, but again, a jump to the Jura Z10 just under 2,200 pounds. Finally, in the end here, this monster is the Miele CM7750, charmingly named, and also two and a half thousand pounds. So unlike a lot of the comparisons, there's a very big spread on price here, but you know, there's a big spread generally, and you kind of want to know, are they good value for money? Do they make good coffee? And so today we're going to break it down into three sections, really. We're going to talk through each of the machines when it comes to pulling shots, brewing coffee. How are they to dial in? What's the coffee you get out of them taste like? Then we're going to talk about milk drinks. These are, I think, very important. All of these machines have an auto milk frothing function. Do they make good texture? Do they get the temperature right? Are they worth owning? And then the third section where we'll talk through the machine's build, the kind of user interface, all of the kind of bits around it. Are they annoying to use? Are they delightful to use? Are they well built? Do they feel cheap and flimsy? And at the end, hopefully, I'll have an opinion on which of these I would recommend. Actually, before we jump too deep into stuff, I do want to get a couple of things out of the way. Missing from this lineup is the most requested machine, which is the Breville or Sage Oracle Touch. That is not, to me, a conventional bean to cup machine, because a human is doing quite a key piece in terms of moving coffee around and actually maybe being involved in puck prep a little bit, or at least having an overview of what's happening there. So it's a different machine. It's a different category. Maybe the best of this can go head to head with that in the future, but it, it sort of didn't belong here. Second, I'm not going to do an extensive walkthrough of each of these machines. They're just isn't time. I'm not going to go through menus or features or that kind of stuff too much. Really what we're assessing here is which of these machines can make great coffee. And that's espresso, those are milk drinks, and, and how is the experience of achieving those drinks? That's what we're looking at. There are loads of videos on YouTube of these machines, full walkthroughs, kind of teardowns, all that sort of stuff is there if you want to go deeper on one particular model. But today we're just going to focus on making coffee. Onto the testing, onto the Melita. So brewing espresso with this was okay. Now I will say up front, the espresso we're going to get out of this is not traditional espresso. I made a whole video about dialing these things in and talking about how you have to use longer ratios. So start with the dose on this thing. This thing at maximum dose would get to about 16, just under 16 and a half grams of coffee, which is a pretty decent dose. It's the upper end of the machines tested. So Generally, I was pulling longer shots. It didn't seem to compensate for increased dose. So if you asked it for 60 mil, but you had your dose set to maximum, you would typically get about 55 out. So uh, that kind of worked. 16 to 55 surprisingly worked pretty well, nailed some decent extractions. I did do a bunch of testing with Staler coffee with this, and this is the first machine that very clearly was doing some aeration to create additional crema. So somewhere in this brew chamber, it's kind of foaming the drink up a little bit. So it looks great, but you know, slightly artificial. There's fresh coffee in now, obviously, but I did want to kind of highlight that a few of these machines do do a little bit of aeration to the crema to give you a more pleasing visual experience on your coffee. So with the Dose set to max, the drink set to intense. Uh, we're just going to pull, I think, 60 mils out, which should give us about 55 in the cup. Let's brew. So a pretty thick layer of foam on top. Looks good. We'll get used to the robot noises today. That foam looks a little pale, but that's because, again, it is aerated. It's kind of foamed coffee rather than traditional crema. Now, this machine has two bean hoppers, but they both feed into the same grinder. So essentially a different side of the trap door opens to allow different doses in. This is one of uh, three machines that have multiple hoppers, but they all feed the same grinder anyway, which is kind of weird. There will be some mixing inevitably. So if you're kind of putting decaf in one side, know that there may be some ground coffee of fully caffeinated coffee in and around the grinder that, that may have a tiny bit of cross-contamination. The coffee from this has been decent. Uh, I would say it's well extracted, 
We tested it out, it was hitting 20% extraction. Not particularly strong, but none of them are going to be particularly strong for that kind of an extraction in, in this kind of thing. Grind is one finer than factory. They kind of discourage you from adjusting the grind until you've made at least 100 coffees but I would still adjust the grind, uh, but I wouldn't go all the way fine on this one for sure. So when it comes to espresso, a reasonable quality of brew. Uh, I could certainly turn this into another drink and have it taste pretty good. So I would say for the espresso sort of purity, bang for buck on this one is actually pretty decent, it being the cheapest machine. So the DeLonghi Dynamica Plus. I obviously have made fun of the advertising of this machine uh, and going into it, I wasn't really sure what to expect when it came to espresso brewing, but I will say, it is a standout in a number of ways. This thing brews differently to most of the other ones in that it will actually grind quite fine. In fact, it'll grind so fine that everything falls completely to pieces. And if you grind it on the finer settings, your extraction falls through the floor. It's just awful, channels terribly. Kind of weird that they let you grind so fine when the machine clearly cannot handle it. Now, factory temperature setting was, was really low. I had to crank it to high. Low, it tasted even sub 80 degrees Celsius, and the cups were nice, but incredibly dull. Uh, hot, much better, much more interesting. This dose is relatively low compared to the others. The maximum dose I squeezed out of this was about nine grams, uh, and the yield, therefore, was about 34 grams out, 35 grams out, to give close to a four to one that tasted pretty good. This doesn't do any sort of fake crema stuff. If you put stale coffee in this, you'll get ugly, ugly espresso. But of course, we have fresh coffee here today. Let's make some espresso. Now, obviously, this is a smaller yield than some other machines. So if you're going to turn this into a milk drink, you might want to put two of these in the bottom if you're going to make a big cup or, you know, have a smaller cappuccino in the morning if that's your thing. How does it taste, though? Pretty good. If anything, I would make this shot maybe a little bit bigger. It's got quite a lot of intensity for its size, which is interesting. The extraction is relatively high. It, it tastes sweet. It has complexity. The acidity is balanced. It, it is a decent espresso of a sort. If you're interested in the grind setting used for this, because I know some of you might be, I am at grind setting three. This thing, as you can see, is a single bean hopper for your fresh coffee beans. But anything finer than three, things really fell apart with this machine. But at three, that kind of turbo shot style, lungo thing, tasted good, extracted really well was a little bit impressed. Again, especially for the money, this is £1,200, and so at the lower end of the price points, but competing when it came to espresso brewing. Making coffee with the Gaggia Academia initially was very frustrating. Uh, I found myself chasing this machine around a little bit more than the others, really sort of struggling to get a decent extraction, but I got there in the end. Programming on this isn't too painful. Uh, you can sort of set one, two, or three for your dose size. Maximum dose I got out of this was about nine and a half grams. This really needed a good four to one ratio. So we were brewing about nine and a half to I think 45 grams out. Once I added the longer pre-wet in the, in the programming functions, extractions were pretty decent. It's not the best espresso brewer of the group. Uh, it was, I think, quite frustrating to use overall, but it got there in the end. Now, one thing to note, I ended up having to go pretty fine on the grinder. The grinder says adjust it when it's running, but it's really hard to, to sort of grip the knob without taking off the cover of this thing here. But the moment you take it off, this little magnet is gone and it knows the cover's off and it won't operate. So just just as a side note, it should really come into UX, UI, but, but when it comes to grind adjustment, a bit a bit annoying for me. One of the things to note before we brew some coffee, often after the pre-wet, it seems to kind of sneeze out a little bit of water from the lines. If it's been rinsed, it looks like clear water, but it, it just doesn't seem particularly appetizing to me. You know, I, I kind of wish it wouldn't do that. The other machines don't do that as much. This one seems to do it quite a lot. As you saw there, brews run really pretty fast, which is sort of notable, but that's, I think, the longer pre-wet contributing to that. And certainly your total contact time is a little bit longer with the longer pre-wet function. The espresso still just tastes a little empty, and I know that's because it's a longer ratio. There just hasn't been as much sweetness in the cup as with other brewers out there. Maybe that's an evenness thing, I'm not entirely sure. The coffee is okay, and I think if I was drinking it in another drink, I wouldn't be uh, noticing the sort of faults of the cup as much, but as a straight espresso, it, it tends to be just a little bit more sour, even at higher extractions, which suggests uneven extraction, uh, and just lacking a little bit of sweetness. It's not unpleasant, it's just not as good as some of the other brews out there. 
So let's talk Espresso with the Siemens EQ9. This one kind of threw me for a loop the first time, actually. There is a strength selector on the front here, and you can kind of scroll down, and it will let you go from extra strong into double shot strong plus. Once you get into double shot, it is literally that. It's going to grind and dose twice, in a way. Not in the same dose, it'll kind of pull a shot and then pull another shot on top. So for today, we're just going to sit at extra strong, which is the maximum dose for a single sort of basket full. In this case, that's about 12.8 grams. So it was the maximum dose I kind of measured of the kind of dry weight here. Uh, and as a result, we're aiming for about 50 mils out, right? Uh, kind of four to one. The grind on this just really doesn't get very fine at all. At the finest grind setting, I was kind of surprised at just how coarse the coffee still was. In addition, there's no kind of fluffing of the crema here. It's a little bit more what you see is what you get kind of thing. So let's push the button and uh, make an espresso. Now this is another dual hopper setup, and I actually quite like the system for switching between the two. There's just a button on the back on the top of the machine that lights up on the relevant side of which hopper you're drawing down from. This is kind of preferable to the other implementations I've seen of which hopper it kind of pulls from. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is the espresso, and the espresso hasn't been the best. At a 4 to 1 ratio, a little bit above here, it's it still feels a little under extracted, even at the finest grind that, as I said, is still pretty coarse. It's not so fine that we would get channeling, it just feels like it needs to go that little bit finer. With a darker roast, I might be okay. But with specialty, I really struggled to get much above 18 to 19%. I just wanted a little bit more extraction, really, just, just to kind of get a bit more texture, a little bit more sweetness, a bit more complexity. I don't mind that it's not as strong as it could be. I, I just wish it was a bit more interesting as a shot. It's not bad. I just feel like it's, it's leaving some goodness in the puck that you throw at the end that I wish it didn't. So the Jura Z10 was a machine that I think I had some expectations for going into this. When I started in coffee nearly 20 years ago, Jura were around and I was selling domestic machines and they were kind of the premium brand in the bean to cup space. And I think they probably still are for many people. This thing is expensive, but can it brew good coffee? Now, on the surface, you don't seem to get much in the way of control. You just get some pictures of coffees that you might want. What's interesting about this machine is that as you start to brew, you can adjust things on the fly. You get a window of time in which you can change the strength or how much coffee is being ground, and a window of time in which you can change the beverage size. That's kind of interesting. You can leave it like that as a one-off. You can save it as that kind of future program. But uh, interesting. As you first look at the machine, though, there's no way to adjust the grind manually that's actually hidden away in a digital menu, which is unusual. So there you would need to enter programming, choose the drink, and here you can now see you've got some grind control. That's kind of weird, and I don't know how I feel about it, but that's the way that they want to do these things. It does mean, theoretically, you could program a different grind size for a different drink. And that's a lot of flexibility, if it works as well as it seems to. Generally speaking, though, I don't like to do that. I want to get one thing dialed in, get one extract, and then do with that whatever I want to later to make whatever drink I want to make. But the idea is interesting. Let's get the coffee going. While it is a noisy machine, it, it does produce the best looking shots out of any of them. It's definitely doing a good amount of aeration of the crema. This is not normal crema. This is kind of like foamed coffee in a way, but it looks great. The pour looks good, uh, uh, and something about it looks a little bit more appetizing than the other shots from the other machines. Dose-wise, uh, a maximum dose is about 16 and a half grams, and so we're producing about 55 grams out for a balanced espresso. It's pretty good. It's probably probably the best of the the machines when it comes to pulling a shot this feels like it just has a little bit more texture a little bit more fullness it feels that little bit closer to real espresso than maybe some of the other machines it's just maybe fractionally better than the best i got from the delonghi it's not a huge improvement by any stretch but it does feel just a little bit more capable now it might be that the the kind of the way that it looks as it pours is influencing me you do eat with your eyes a little bit but it, it does make good coffee. It's doing a pretty good job extracting the coffee. There's enough control over all the necessary bits that, that it's kind of easy to dial in and tweak and adjust. So of these machines, when it comes to espresso brewing, this is, you know, in the top spot or definitely in the top two spots alongside the DeLonghi. Before we talk about brewing with the Miele CM7750, I should explain how this particular unit ended up on the bench. 
to choose these machines, I put a call out to my Patreon supporters. They could pick a manufacturer and a machine. And what we did is per manufacturer, I picked the most requested machine. And when I went to the website, I saw it was expensive, but I, I couldn't really see the size of it. It's monstrous. It's huge. I mean, it's two and a half thousand pounds. So you feel like, I don't know, more is good, but it's a lot. It's just very big. And on the website, it didn't look that big, but it's, it's really big. Brewing espresso with it has been frustrating, if I'm truly honest. This again is a machine that feels like it's not really built to work with light roast specialty coffees. The grind adjustment is hidden in the side here. On the side panel is a little switch. It's okay at its finest setting. Some of the machines aren't. This one is fine. It's still actually pretty coarse. You get three hoppers on top of here, which again is super weird. Just one grinder for your money, but three hoppers, and it'll sort of open a trap door to feed the grinder from whichever one. Again, contamination is kind of a concern if you're really worried about decaf or caffeinated coffees intermingling. The actual brew process is annoying to dial in. The, the kind of process is hidden behind several menus. It's one of those ones where if you want to change the portion size, the, the beverage mass, you have to kind of press go and then hit stop at the appropriate uh, sort of time. It hasn't always replicated that amount particularly accurately for me. Uh, and so overall, a bit frustrating, but also kind of absurd. Let's make some coffee and, and you'll see what I mean. Very noisy. Why did that move? Why add a motor to a part that on every other machine, you just move up and down with your hand and that works fine. Why, why put a point of failure there? I don't know. The coffee looks good. It's another machine aerating the crema a little bit to kind of give that artificial foaminess. So the shots look quite nice. Taste wise, under extracted. And for a couple of reasons, this did not achieve the programming that I just wanted. It shorted me, I think eight or nine grams on what was requested, but more than that, the grind is just too, too coarse. I've added an additional pre-brewing stage to this to try and increase the extraction. And that hasn't worked. I think this is a machine that genuinely just struggles with the very light, very dense coffees that specialty people may wish to enjoy. Specialty people, specialty coffee lovers. Maybe that's better. Weird coffee people like me. I would say it's probably the weakest of the group when it comes to brewing specialty coffee uh, and just the most frustrating to dial in with, make changes to. Uh, yeah, I, I think unfortunately, despite being the most expensive, what you're getting for your money is not more advanced brewing technologies. We're going to go into the milk testing next. I'm going to make a cappuccino with each of the machines. It just seems a good benchmark for foam quality for that kind of stuff there. I'm going to be using a milk alternative because that's what I would choose to drink just so you know going in. On we go to testing. So the milk steaming setup on this one is the box of milk on the side, the tube that then runs into the brew unit or also the, the front end of the brew unit. Let's see what the results are like. Now, texturally, this is not looking superb. It's going to benefit, I think, from a little bit of a stir. And as you kind of pull it back, some of the foam here is actually OK. There's just a few big bubbles from right at the end. But I suspect most of the texture is kind of adequate. That sounds harsh, but you know what I mean. In fairness, pretty, pretty good. Like the coffee taste is decent, as, as we discussed before. And obviously we've heated milk not too hot. That's good. So the temperature I would say is good for me, might be a touch cold for some people, but I think it's a nice temperature. Texture is decent, but not outstanding. Overall, it's really not, not a bad drink. Uh, I'm not upset by the quality of milk foam. I feel it could be better. And if you gave me a traditional machine, I, I, I think I could make it notably better. But for automation, I would call it kind of reasonable. So let's talk about milk with this thing. Now the attachment for the milk, the little sort of uh, cool box goes on the front here. It slots in actually to the place that the hot water spout sits into. This thing does the kind of milk first, coffee second. So we'll have it in a nice glass for that traditional sort of latte macchiato style look, because why not? Uh, let's go. There's a little dial at the top to control your foam level. I'm set to the middle. Let's make a cappuccino. Okay, we've got a drink. It needs a mix. Kind of uh, interesting layering effect going on here, but let's give it a stir. I'm going to call the firm quality on this disappointing. Big bubbles, not a particularly tight, fine, moussey microphone. Not horrific, but 
four out of 10. Temperature wise, it feels a little hotter, sort of upper end of where you'd want things, but not too bad. Um, obviously we were having a relatively small espresso to start with. For a single shot, this would be kind of the max drink size you might have, that might be just right for you. But flavor wise, decent. Obviously the extraction was pretty good. As long as the milk is not overheated or anything weird has happened, it should taste pretty good. So flavor, good. Texture, I feel like I just want a less dry foam, a tighter knit foam, a moussier foam. This is not delivering on that front. So milk with the Gagia Academia. There's this large carafe that clicks onto the front and this little piece here actually has two positions, which is notable. One is to the side where milk will come out into your cup. The other I really like when you bring it back to the sort of handle position, that's a rinse position that will rinse the unit into the drain box. Just neater, nicer for me overall. Let's see what the texture is like though. Texture of the foam, kind of okay. I have this set to, I think, a normal amount of foam, not like extra foam, because I, I don't want too much foam. I would say probably comparable to the DeLonghi's foam quality. Not horrific, you just can do a lot better in the world of milk foaming. I don't really like the angry purge of steam right at the end on top of the cup. That seems to be a very strange design decision or a workflow decision. Overall, it, it's not a bad drink. There's a good extract of coffee. The milk is not too hot. Uh, the texture is just where it falls down a little bit. The EQ9 is interesting and stands out because it has an integrated milk tank here. Like it's built right into the side of the machine and I don't know how I feel about that. It's kind of weird that you would have a hot machine and want to build a cold thing into it. I would imagine it's pretty well insulated, but I suppose from a workflow perspective, from a look perspective, it's nice to have it integrated and not have a tank and an awkward little hose running between the two. As for the drinks that it makes, let's find out. Having given that a mix, I have to say the quality of the foam is actually quite good. It's a little bit dry, but not too bad. The bubbles are pretty tight. It looks pretty moussey. There's a nice quantity of foam for me on the drink. So really, really not bad. You can tell the coffee lacks a little bit of something in there. There's a little bit of acidity creeping through uh, from that brew that isn't quite what I want it to be. But actually the milk is pretty good, I would imagine, with, uh, again, a more developed roast. This kind of a drink would work really well. I would say it's decent. I would say that's good milk foam. It's not outstanding. You could do better with a traditional machine, but it's actually very good. So as you look at this machine right now in this setup, you'll notice something a little bit unusual. The Jura has the little tube that feeds the head here where it'll do the foaming and heating, but no container. You can buy an additional container, but for 2,200 pounds, you don't get it for free, which is kind of wild, but also kind of in line with how a lot of premium brands operate. They might argue that to include it with it would make it 2,300 pounds or something like that, and people didn't want to spend the extra, I don't know. I find, I find it kind of weird. Granted, you can just stick it into a container of milk or milk alternative and away you go. There's nothing else to wash up apart from the tube itself. So maybe that's good, I, I, I don't know. I, I find it kind of a weird decision from a brand perspective, uh, from an experience perspective, but What's the actual drink like? Now, this cappuccino looks like a very foamy affair. Let's see what we actually get. That seems like a pretty accurate representation of what it promised. Now, that's a good amount of foam, and the foam for this quantity, which is a thing, obviously the more foam you have, the, the higher the chance it's dried out a little bit. It's not, it's not bad. It's not outstanding. It's sort of six and a half, seven out of ten. As for the taste though, pretty good. It tastes as you'd expect. The milk's a good temperature actually. The texture of the milk is pretty good for drinking. Touch dry as I said, but overall really not bad. And I would think drinks more like a flat white or something else would work even better like this. Yeah, it, it, it's a good extract of coffee mixed with, you know, a nice temperature and texture of milk. Pretty good. Really pretty good. You know, there are certainly cafes serving worse than this, but there are cafes serving significantly better as well. And we once again return to the Miele. The milk system again is a sort of separate container here. It's just a glass container, which is nice, feels premium, not particularly good for sort of thermal retention or keeping the milk gold. And that feeds into the bizarre uppy downy head here. Let's make a drink. If you're watching this with headphones, I'm really sorry. This machine just appears to be an auditory assault. 
Uh, it still just won't be quiet now, and this sort of fan or whatever seems to run for a while. I'll try and talk over the top of it. The process of dialing in milk drinks is not great. It's another one where you have to sort of put your container underneath, fill it to the point that you want, and sort of hit stop and save. Not super accurate in its uh, recreation or, or replay of that particular recipe either. The milk foam, though, is quite nice. Like, that's a nice level of foam for a cappuccino. The foam is nice and, you know, tightly foamed. It's not flawless, it's another six and a half out of ten, but really not bad. Temperature's pretty good. The drink is let down by the taste of the espresso being a little bit weak and, and under-extracted. Attaching this the first time is annoying, because right now this thing is up high, and so you have to sort of start brewing to get it to drop down enough that you can connect the little tube. Just kind of bizarre to see the up-down thing with the tube on the side. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. I'm, I'm going to stop talking about this now, because the sound is just winding me up. But overall, the drinks are okay. I'm maybe, you know, struggling with this thing a little bit. So the Melita here, it did pretty good coffee, it did decent milk foam. How is the rest of the user experience on this machine? And if I'm honest, quite poor. I would say, first and foremost, these buttons are, are just bad. Uh, particularly if you don't use the sliders. If you use the little slider thing here at the bottom, that's kind of a nice touch, that's good. But if you actually want to use, say, the plus minus buttons, they are miserably unresponsive and irritating. The build quality overall is kind of fine. You know, they've hidden away the grind adjustment inside the side panel here, so it's not obvious to you. There's a lid that is, frankly, bad on top of these things here. I, I just think it looks really weird the way that it sits up like this. I don't understand why it isn't flush. I know it's easier to pick up, but they've also put a little groove here to get your finger into to lift something up, so why make this giant thing that's just bad? I think jewel hoppers aren't easy to recommend, I would say that. Like, uh, it works okay as a jewel hopper, but I'm not a huge fan of it. Just, just overall, I found this a frustrating machine to work with, but it's by far the cheapest. And actually, if I was buying one of these just thinking purely about espresso, it would be a contender because for its price point, it, it kind of bang for buck is pretty good. I think sometimes about, you know, what it would be like to try and fight the user interface before I've had coffee, and I would imagine a great deal of rage. It, it is, for me, actually a deal breaker. UX UI really, really matters to me. And even though I think it makes good coffee, especially for the money, the, the, the buttons here alone are just too frustrating. You may not have these same rage issues, though. If you own one of these, I'd really be interested to hear your comments down below about how your experience has been with the buttons. Let's start with the build on this. Uh, and it does feel a little cheap and plasticky, but it is at the lower end of the price points we're discussing in today's video. The footprint overall is a big win for me. Like, the, the use of space is very clever. I like it being a small machine, that's good. As for the sort of front-end user interface, the screen is nice. The user interface, okay. The accuracy of the touch points is a little bit low for me. I've, uh, you know, I've mispressed espresso quite a few times and sort of started a cappuccino, though thankfully it's relatively easy to abort the process. The programming is a little frustrating. I, I wish you just had an option to add five more milliliters to your espresso versus what it is, but to program your sort of desired espresso size, it requires running the machine, measuring as you brew, and stopping at your desired setting. So every time you want to increase the size of your shot, you'd have to kind of break out the scales, go through that process. Uh, it's a little bit convoluted to me, whereas other machines will just let you add five mils to the next brew. That's much easier. That, to me, is far more preferable. I suppose there's more granularity in this, but I don't always want granularity. I just want to get to a better coffee as quickly as I can. Overall, okay. Not spectacular, but, but really not bad to work with. The EQ9's build and its UI. Well, firstly, there's a big jump in price. We're at £1,700 here. That's only £500 more than the previous machine. And you would expect an improved fit and finish. And I think you get that. Generally, I would say this is a, a good-looking machine of a particular style, sure. But the lines are good. Materials feel good. Uh, it feels well-built. Not a huge footprint, but not particularly small. The front here, I actually quite like. I, I quite like the combination of these buttons with the display here. Uh, I think it keeps it simple enough in that day-to-day -day you're not interacting with anything particularly complicated, but you can quickly and easily make small adjustments. Uh, I think as a UI UX experience, pretty decent. The grinder the lack of ability to go particularly fine does seem like a flaw in this, and the grind controls in the back of these things here feel cheap and flimsy. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't feel like a robust piece of this unit. 
But everything else, I think, is, is, is pretty well done. You kind of feel like you understand what you're getting for your money in terms of build compared to the cheaper models there. So the build of the Z10 feels, looks pretty premium in this particular world. Certainly within these group of machines, this felt the most premium or luxurious. It's, it's little details, like the bean hopper is heavy, it's weighty, it's kind of a weird design, and, and I don't love the bean hopper being the size that it is. It's, it's really big, but it does feel nice. The materials feel nice, the click wheel feels nice, the touchscreen is responsive. They've made sure that the drinks are far enough apart on the display that you won't accidentally press the wrong thing, and it's a very simple user interface. Below the hood, it's easy to access things like drink settings, or if you push and hold this button, you can get into a lot more kind of programming settings around cleaning, around other programming in the machine, and there's there's a host of features under there, but they're, they're mostly kept at arm's length, kept out of your field of view because it just wants you to think about making coffee. Overall, I get why they have the reputation that they do. It feels very well built, it feels very well made, it feels that little bit premium. The fact that you've got, you know, the, the blue LEDs over here for the crisp cool water, and then the warm LEDs here when you're pulling shots of espresso. It's a little obvious, but it's also just a, a nice touch. I find hiding the grind adjustment away a strange thing. It requires I trust the machine quite a lot, but it seems to produce good tasting espresso, so I can't really argue with that. And we return once again to the Miele to discuss fit and finish. I'll be honest, I do not understand the price of this machine. For two and a half thousand pounds, the fit and the finish is not great. Like, it's quite a cheap feeling plastic. It's a gloss plastic on this side, it's a kind of brushed effect here. It doesn't really work super well for me, but you, you may feel differently. Three hoppers and one grinder doesn't feel like the feature set you might want it to be. I don't know when you'd want three different sets of coffees slowly, you know, staling inside a little hopper on top of a warm machine. At least you have a big cup warmer on top which I guess, you know, it, it maybe feels like a machine for an office, right? Like that's the cell here, which is you should be able to make lots of coffees for lots of people rather than just at home. But if I was in an office, the noise alone would mean it would need to be a long way away from where people work. Let's, let's talk about the UI, because it and I did not get on. The screen is not particularly beautiful. The information offered is, is pretty poor. Finding things within the menu is not particularly intuitive. I didn't really like the touch screen. I didn't like the button layouts, I, I just sort of struggled with it. And that's just me, you may not have as much of an issue as I do. One other note in testing, this machine loves to rinse, it really does. Uh, all of the machines will run periodic rinses, I just feel like this wanted to rinse more than the others, and, and the more a machine rinses, the more it draws down its water tank, the more it wants you to refill it, empty it out the drain box, they just, they just nag you a little bit more. The upside, obviously, is that you have a cleaner machine on the inside, but I feel like this one is just on the side of a bit too much rinsing. And I, if it makes my notes in testing, then it really stands out. And, and that was just one thing I wanted to highlight. And so I, I confess that through the lens of price and experience, I've really struggled with this one, uh, probably more than the others. I feel like maybe it just didn't belong in this lineup and it's built for a different environment than the home. Uh, and so I'm cautious of being unfair but I still struggle to really see why it's so expensive for the feature set and sort of experience that you get. Let's get straight to the answer to the question. If I was given unlimited budget, which of these would I buy? And the answer probably is the Jura. It's a lot of money though. £2,200 would buy you a very nice grinder and a very good espresso machine. You'd have to do a bit more work, but you would get better results. But Within the category, I think it did really well. The espresso was very good, the fit, the finish, the build is good, the footprint is reasonable. It's a good machine. Not the best milk, and interesting that you know the best coffee and the best milk did not necessarily line up, but overall UI was good, lots of positive things to say about it, and you can see why it's at the top end. The glaring omission of a milk container is kind of weird, but I guess I'll let that one go. However, I do want to talk a little bit about the cheaper end of things. Actually, these two here showed pretty well, particularly the DeLonghi. Now, obviously I've teased the DeLonghi's advertising, but I, I thought it performed really pretty well. For the money, it was up there in terms of shot quality. The milk was fine, you know, again, unspectacular, but kind of decent. The footprint is small, it's well put together, good UI. Yeah, I, I, I think it's good. Is the Jura twice as good as the DeLonghi? I'm not sure. I think this is probably the best value machine in this group that we've tested here today. Uh, and I actually think the Melita was okay. The UI was kind of a deal breaker for me. If that was fixed, then that would be much more interesting, but it was a good little performer. The others, 
in, you know, in some cases quite frustrating, in other cases, okay, just, just outperformed. But an interesting test, I think, nonetheless. Now, as I always say in these reviews, I don't get to keep these machines. My Patreon helps buy these things, uh, and as a result, I give them away at the end of this to some of my Patreon supporters. It makes me very happy to give these things away, especially because I certainly don't have room for them here in the studio. If you have one of these, you think I've been unfair to it, leave me a comment, let me know your thoughts, let us know what you think, what, what kind of months or years of ownership has felt like to you. Is there one I really should have reviewed but I didn't? Let me know down in the comments below. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.